everyone, it is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, here with a live Ask Lee video Q&A. And right now, as always, for, well, as always, as last few weeks anyway, I'm doing these video Q&A and taking questions from my Facebook followers. So if you want to post any questions for this live video chat, head on over to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page. And that is facebook.com forward slash total.fitness.bodybuilding if you want to type it in. And right there on that page, I'm answering some questions that were sent in. So it's actually the second post down right now is where I'm taking the questions where I posted about doing the live streaming Ask Lee video chat. So I'm just going to take as many questions from that thread as I can over the next 30 minutes. So I'm setting my trusty timer for 30 minutes. And we'll knock out as many questions as we can. So here we go. Uh, first question, Moses Kale says, how to get protein naturally? Okay, protein is found in virtually all animal products. It's found in a lot of different foods. So, I mean, I, I have a list there. I mean, you can go. Best thing to do, if you download the free bodybuilding quick start kit, which is on my main website, leehayward.com, there is a nutrition guide in there that covers uh, all the popular protein foods, carbohydrate foods, and fats. And it also includes a sample meal plan that you can get. So definitely you can download that and it, like I say, covers a lot of more information than I can kind of cover here in this live streaming video chat. But protein foods, definitely, you want to make the majority of your protein intake from... Oh, shut up, my timer, I turned the volume down. Uh, you want to get the majority of your protein from natural foods, and then supplements are just that, an extra, a supplement to your diet. But obviously, you want to get the majority of your protein intake through natural whole foods. Uh, animal protein is fantastic because it's a source of complete protein, contains all essential amino acids. But you can also get protein from vegetable sources as well. That's a good additional source of protein. But a good benchmark if you're in a mass building phase Try to get about a gram of protein per pound of body weight from solid food sources and then supplement on top of that. But again, all that's covered in my Bodybuilding Nutrition Made Simple. Head on over to LeeHayward.com and you can download that guide. And let's say it's got a sample list of different foods that you can include in your diet. Uh, next question was asking about the time of this video chat over in the UK. I I have no idea about the other time zones in the world. I live in Newfoundland right now, and I'm familiar with North American time zones, but I'm not familiar with time zones in throughout Europe, Australia, and places like that. So if you're looking for time zones, go to dateandtime.com. They have a time zone converter, and that's what I refer people to. Anyway, that was a question posted earlier when I said I was going to be hosting this video chat later today. Bill has a question. Bill Short, and he says, what are your thoughts on Jig's dinner? Now, if you're not familiar with what this is, this is a Newfoundland tradition. This is what Newfies will have for Sunday dinner. It basically means, you know, a traditional cooked meal, and it usually involves boiled vegetables, and I'm not a big fan of Jig's dinner. It's, it's a traditional new meal, but I'm not a fan of it because basically you're taking all your vegetables, you're throwing them in a pot, you're boiling the crap out of them, and then you're eating these boiled vegetables. And all the nutrients that are in those vegetables are getting boiled away, and most people throw the water away afterwards. So you're left with a lot of vegetables with not as much nutrients as they should have. I'm more of a fan of steaming vegetables or just... If you're, if you're talking about the like green vegetables, I like to eat them raw, stuff like that. I'm not a big fan of uh, a typical Sunday jigs dinner. I know people who are Newfoundlanders who are watching this right now are getting a kick out of it. But for everybody else, they're like, what the hell is Lee talking about? So we'll just leave that question alone. Uh, 
Next question here is from Nikki. And Nikki's saying, uh, I can't not feeling sore after bench pressing, saying weight is not the issue. Good form and all. Advice would be highly appreciated. You don't have to get sore in order to build muscle. And I actually posted up a YouTube video about that. Uh, oh, I, it was a long time ago, but let me just see if I can find the title for you. I, th I think it might be just called Do You have to get sore to build muscle. Let me just see. I'll get the title for you so you can go on to YouTube and do a search for us. Uh, yep, okay, that's exactly what it's called. If you just go to YouTube and type in, do you have to get sore to build muscle, that will show my video. It should pop up there. And I cover a complete video about what muscle soreness is and why it's not necessary to get sore in order to make muscle gains. Now, sore, soreness is a weird thing. I think somebody asked about this last week as well. But bottom line, people who get the most sore from training are generally beginners and people who are really out of shape. If you are consistent with your training and you're in good shape, then chances are you're not going to get as sore because your body is recovering faster and it's you're not getting this breakdown that, you, that a lot of beginners get. So for the most part, advanced lifters do not get as sore after training as beginners. So don't use soreness as your guideline as to whether you're making progress or not because it's, it's not a good guideline. Judge your actual progress. Judge your strength gains. Judge your body composition gains. Judge that kind of stuff. Not whether you're getting sore or not. Okay, another question here. This one's Santiago saying, is eating raw eggs a good source of protein? And the answer to that is no. Raw eggs are not a good source of protein. And in fact, the human body has trouble digesting raw eggs. I actually... Let me... Get the specifics here for you. If I can answer this question properly. Uh, I have a link there on my website on. Let's see if I can find this. Ah, shit, I can't find it. <laughs> but there, there's. I, when you consume eggs, like you hear some people talking about like drinking eggs or mixing eggs in with their protein shakes and stuff like that, more often than not, they're not using raw eggs. They're using pasteurized egg whites. That's the common thing amongst bodybuilders these days is pasteurized liquid egg whites. And I use them myself. You know, you can get them at most places. Uh, Costco carries them. You can order them online in bulk. Uh, so you can definitely... A lot of places carry them. Okay, now just give me a second. I'm trying to find that link for you to find the information about. It. All right. Okay, here it was. Uh, the human body cannot digest raw egg. So if you're like doing the Rocky routine, you know, the old mix a dozen eggs in a glass and try and drink it down, you're not getting the best benefit from the protein in those eggs. And that's because there's a substance called avidin, I believe I'm pronouncing that right, A-V-I-D-I-N, avidin, which is found in raw egg, and the body cannot digest it. And not to mention, there's also the threat of salmonella. So if you want to get the most out of your, most protein out of your eggs, what I recommend you do, either cook your eggs or use pasteurized egg whites. And a lot of places carry them. Uh, one company, for example, Egg Whites International, they carry pasteurized egg whites. There's a lot of places online carrying them. And you can also buy them in the grocery store. It's pretty common to go into the egg slash dairy section of your grocery store and see cartons of pasteurized liquid egg whites. And it's a really convenient way to get your eggs. So you can certainly have the, the liquid egg whites because it's technically not raw. It's pasteurized, so it's been 
heated, the bacteria is, you know, so there's no harmful bacteria, no risk of salmonella, and it also breaks down the avidin, which is in the egg, the raw egg, so your body can actually digest it and utilize it and maximize the protein absorption. So that's the deal with eggs. Next question from Robert. He says, which is better to do first? Cut first and then bulk or bulk and then cut? It depends on the individual. There's there's no set rule for whether you should focus on bulking or cutting because it depends on you. I mean, if you're a skinny guy, bulk up. If you're a fat guy, trim down. <laughs> if you're in the middle, then you kind of need to evaluate where you want to be in the long run. Uh, I will say this, it's easier to lose fat than it is to build muscle. And the reason I say this is because anybody, well, not anybody, most people can probably get like ripped, meaning like defined abs within six months or so of strict dieting. So if, if you're like the typical guy training in the gym who is an average build, Within six months of following a strict fat loss diet, you could have defined visible abdominal definition. However, it's going to take years of training to build a thick muscular physique. And if you go to any local bodybuilding competition, any novice level bodybuilding competition, you'll see a lot of guys who are ripped, but you'll see only a few who are really thick and muscular. So it takes years to build a thick muscular physique, but it can take months to just get lean. So look at it from that point of view. Watch your main goal. If it is if it is to build a bigger, more muscular physique, then you probably want to focus on gaining size first. Okay, what else we got? Next question from Robin. Rob, Robin Jim saying, I'm guessing... Okay, he's just talking about the time of the show. Never mind. Uh, Mullo is asking, I'd love to view that video on YouTube, the one where you'll be answering all the questions. That, that's this one. Uh, another question, let's see. What is the best carbs, protein, and fat ratio for losing fat while retaining muscle? I'm currently 22% body fat, looking to get down to 10%. I work out with weights five times a week, and I don't do any cardio. Okay, what I would recommend whenever training for fat loss and you're making some switches. Number one mistake I see what you're doing right now. You're not doing any cardio and your goal is fat loss. Start doing some cardio. Seriously, uh, regular cardio is one of the best things that I found when I'm training myself, when I'm training coaching students. Increasing your cardio and doing some daily preferably daily cardio, is fantastic for fat loss. As a benchmark, I usually shoot for an hour cardio a day when I'm dieting for competition. As for carbs, protein, fat ratios, I, I've found myself, I work better on a higher protein, higher fat, lower carb diet. That works well for me. But again, everyone's individual. Some people get by on a higher carb diet. So it's something you really need to experiment with and see what works best for you. There's no real cut and dry answer to it because we all have different metabolisms. But generally, and this, this is a good general guideline that works for a lot of people, if you focus on consuming the majority of your food from lean protein, green veggies, and healthy fat, that is a good fat loss diet. It's a good healthy diet because you're getting all the high nutrient foods while keeping the empty calories to a minimum. I mean, there's essential fatty acids, there's essential amino acids, but there's really no essential starches or essential sugars. You know, we can get by on protein, green veggies, and healthy fat, and keeping the starch and sugars and all that stuff to a minimum. You don't need to have all that stuff. So that's what I base my personal diet around, is the high nutrient food. And if you do that, plus bump up the cardio, I can promise you, I mean, you're going to see some improvements and you're going to move yourself in the right direction towards fat loss. 
Okay. Quick. Wet my whistle for a second. All right, Grandy has a question, and he says, is decline bench press better with a barbell or dumbbells, and is it good to do it at all? Personal recommendation, I'm a fan of doing the decline bench with a barbell versus the dumbbell, and the reason for that is just the setup. It's damn hard to set up for a decline bench with dumbbells, especially as you work up to heavier weight and if you're training by yourself it's definitely harder because first off if you look at the way most decline benches are set up you have to get onto the bench lock your legs into the, the foot placements on the end of the bench then lower yourself down trying to do that while holding on to heavy dumbbells is really hard so unless you have spotters who can hand you the dumbbells when you're already in position or at least assist you in getting in position, it's going to be really awkward to do decline dumbbell bench press, especially as you work up to heavier weight. So for that reason alone, it's a lot easier to do decline barbell bench. I mean, even if you have uh, if you, two sp if you have two spotters who can literally, once you get into position on the bench, to hand you a dumbbell each, then yeah, you can do decline dumbbell bench. That's fine. Uh, but if you only have one spotter, then it's probably going to be awkward, and you'd probably be better off having that spotter assist you with the barbell rather than the, the decline dumbbell. Now, that's just my personal opinion. I know there's lots of guys out there probably, you know, doing decline dumbbell bench and love it and getting great gains with it, and they've figured out a way to get set up, no problem, more power to them. But that's just my personal opinion and preference. Uh, as far as it, is it a good exercise, the decline bench is a good exercise because it takes some of the shoulder rotation out of the bench. So if you find your shoulders bother you when doing flat bench, then the decline bench may be a good alternative. Still allow you to work the chest heavily and may place less shoulder rotation. So less strain on the rotator cuff, less risk of a shoulder injury. And it's just a good change. I mean, if, if you've been doing like flat bench or incline bench for a long time, you kind of hit a plateau, then just changing the bench angle can work the muscles in a different way and help spur out some new growth. So, yeah, I mean, it's a good exercise. Definitely, it's another bench press variation you can do. Jeremiah Paul has a question saying, what is a good workout schedule for bodybuilding? Uh, there's a lot. What I recommend for you, Jeremiah Paul, is to download the free 12-week workout program that I have on my website. That will give you a good workout schedule for bodybuilding. So if you haven't already done so, head on over to LeeHayward.com. Right there in the top corner, there's a link that says free 12-week workout program. Click on that, and that will be a good schedule that you can follow. So. Sani Giz says, Hey Lee, I'm stuck at 60 kilograms on the bench press for four reps. How can I lift more weights? My target is 80 kilograms this year. Do I, do I lack with diet? I don't know if you lack with diet. I don't even know what you're eating. You never said. Um, if you're looking for a good bench press specialization program, I actually put one together, it's called Blaster Bench, and it's one of my original programs, the thing is, that's what I actually started with online, oh my god, back in 97, <laughs> that's when the original Blaster Bench program came out, so it's been around for a while, but guess what, it still works, so if you're looking for a good bench press specialization program, I recommend you head on over to BlasterBench.com and check that out, that is a good program that will help you specialize with the bench and will also help you get bigger and stronger all over but it's primarily a bench specialization program okay Andrew has a question saying I used to be 240 pounds uh, I lost the weight down to 178 but no six-pack I bulked up and hit 201 cut to 183 still no six-pack or even abs showing at all I'm bulking up again, 
I'm now 195. My question is, if while cutting I couldn't obtain a six pack, why are my abs showing up while bulking this time, eating 3,000 calories a day? I hope you can answer and thank you. Have a great day. All right. Um, Okay, you, you bulked, you, you, you were fat, you dieted, you bulked, you fat, you dieted, up and down, up and down, and now you're starting to see some abs. Chances are your abs are starting to show because you're building muscle. Like, if you take somebody who's really skinny, but no muscle development, they probably don't have six-pack abs because the abs are muscles. So, I mean, if you don't have the abs developed so that you actually have thick abdominal muscles then you can be skinny and have thin skin and still nothing to show for it. So you're bulking now. I mean, obviously, the whole bulking and cutting phase and just the training in general, you've built muscle and lost fat. You've improved your body composition. And I'd say that's why you're starting to see six-pack abs, even though you are, quote-unquote, in a bulking phase right now, is because you're improving your body composition, meaning adding lean muscle and burning body fat. And now you probably are at the stage where there's actually some muscle in your abdominals to start to show. That's my guess. Okay, next question from Adam. He's saying, Lee, I'm about to start a workout program I've put together. It's two weeks of 5x5, five five, then two weeks of three sets of 10. Does this sound good? And how long should you do it before you know if it's work and how long should you do it before you know if it's working or not I'm 215 pounds 20% body fat 30 years old when it comes to any workout program you have to keep a journal write down your programs write down your exercises your sets your reps your weights and all that stuff and keep track of it and that's how you know if it's working or not you know if you're, if you're able to increase your weights from workout to workout if you're seeing uh, body composition progress. You need to track all this stuff and monitor it that way. That's how you're going to know if it's working. As for how long, I, I usually, if I'm starting a brand new workout program, I'll give it at least a month. And that's, that's the minimum. Four to six weeks would be a good benchmark, actually. Because if you're not waiting at least that long, then you really don't know if it's working or not. A lot of people program hop. They'll and it's really bad these days because there's so much stuff coming at you. You got programs left, right, and center. You every time you turn on the the computer, you have a new workout popping in your face. So I mean, you go on YouTube, you'll see a hundred workouts, or uh, more than that, you see millions of workouts. But I mean, you, you got hundreds of workouts coming at you. So people will say, "Well, I want to try this program," and then you know, three days later, they want to try another program, and then next week they want to try another program. And they're just hopping all over the place, not letting one program work. So what you need to do is find a program or make one or whatever and stick to the damn thing. Allow your body time to adapt and grow to that workout before you change and do something else. If you're changing up your workouts all the time, then your body never gets a chance to adapt and grow. Because that's one of the things when it comes to progress. I mean, you need to follow something stick to it, let your body adapt, grow, and plateau, and then change and do something else. If you're just changing all the time, you're, you're neglecting the whole, you're shortchanging the process. So for this, if you've got a program, stick with it for four to six weeks. If, if after that you're still making gains, then keep doing it. There's no reason to quit because, you know, four weeks have gone by. If it's working for you, still do it. Keep with it, and then eventually, I mean, once it does start to plateau and you're not making any gains from it, then you can change it up and do something else. All right. Next one from uh, Juan. Juan Gonzalez says, question I have. How do you snatch 135 pounds off the floor to your shoulders? I mean, I can jerk it if somebody places it on my shoulders, but the thing is I cannot snatch it to shoulder height. Please reply back. You're going to need somebody to help you with your Olympic technique there. So, uh, 
I'm not an Olympic lifter. I never claimed to be one, and that's why I don't have any Olympic lifting videos on YouTube. I've never trained Olympic lifting, never competed it, never been coached in it, so I'm not an Olympic lifter. However, what I would suggest you do, find yourself an Olympic lifting coach, either at your gym or get on Facebook and look for one or something like that. Find someone who can help you with those lifts if that's what you want to focus on. And one thing that all Olympic lifters do when they're learning the lifts is they start off really light and get the form down. Olympic lifts are very technical. It's not about, it's not powering weight like in bodybuilding or powerlifting. It's technic, te te technique. So a lot of Olympic lifters will literally start with a broomstick, learn how to snatch a broomstick, learn how to clean a broomstick, then go to an empty barbell. I mean, learn how to, to position the body, how to catch the weight and all that stuff with very light weight, and then gradually increase the weights as you get the technique down pat. So you need someone to go over your technique with you and, and break it down step by step. So uh, that's what I recommend you do. And like I say, there, there's books and tutorials and all that kind of stuff on YouTube that can certainly help you with that. But ideally, if, if you really want to do it right, Find yourself a coach who can help you personally, who can work with you and correct your technique while you're in the gym doing it, rather than trying to figure it out on your own through, you know, asking questions on Facebook and, and watching YouTube videos. You'd be better off to uh, to hire somebody to, or at least find an Olympic lifting coach to go through it with you. That's what I would do if, if I were in your situation. All right, next question from Ravi Bisla. And I go to the gym two days, and on the third day I get a throat infection, which turns into a mild fever, and I lose all my body strength. Then I take rest for four or five days, and it's happening from the last four weeks. I went to the doctor, he said it's just a throat infection. I get a lot of sweat during my workouts, and my gym is... Uh, is not air conditioned. Please advise. I have no idea what to offer you there, man. You go to the gym and you get a throat infection and your gym is not air conditioned. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not a... <laughs> I'm not a doctor and I don't even pretend to be one on YouTube. So, um, I have no advice. Moving on. Uh, Marcus has a question. What's the best way to train the delts? Uh, I train heavy on seated barbell press and start as heavy as possible on side and front raises for the first few sets and then go lighter with higher reps and then a few drop sets. Would you say higher reps for the burn on the isolation delt moves and go for the burn as it's red cell muscle training for muscle tone? Thanks, Lee. Uh, all right. What's the best way to train the delts? I train heavy on the barbell press and start heavy as possible on the side and front raises and then go lighter with higher reps and do drop sets and higher reps for the burn. That's, I mean, most people train all their muscle groups that way. That's a general guideline. You start off with your big heavy moves first and then you move into your lighter isolation moves afterwards. So that structure you have there, I mean, if that is a good basic structure, most workouts are, are planned around that method. So if that's working for your shoulders and you're seeing progress, then by all means you can do that. Uh, the other alternative, there's two basic ways. Like I say, start with your big move first, then do your isolation, and then you have some people who like to switch it up, and that's referred to as pre-exhausting where you do your isolation first and then your mass moves after. It's not necessarily one is better than the other, it's just a different form of training, a different form of muscle stimulation. So what I suggest, stick with what you're doing. Start with the mass building first, then the isolation after. Ride that out for as long as it's working for you. If you're making gains, you're feeling the muscles working and you're seeing progress, then great, keep doing it. Once that stops working, then you can change it up. I mean, if you want to switch to a pre-exhaust routine where you basically just switch the order, do your isolation exercises first and then your compound exercises after, that's, enough. that's a, a way to go about it. Uh, 
again, I mean, anytime with with a program, there's there's multiple ways that you can structure a workout program. It's not that this is better or that's better or worse or anything like that. It's what's working for you right now. So if your program is working, stick with it, ride that wave of momentum for as long as it's working, and then when you find that you're starting to plateau or you're just getting sick and tired and bored of that routine and you want to change up, then you can shoot, do something different. All right, next question from Anthony. What, what's your favorite fitness or bodybuilding DVD? I could be all egotistical and say my own DVD is my favorite DVD, but I won't do that. Um, what's my favorite DVD? I've got a bunch. I mean, I tell you some DVDs that I like watching just for the the, the pure energy from them is like uh, if you watch like uh, Ronnie Coleman or Branch Warren. Uh, I actually. One of them I got out there is uh, one of Branch Warren's DVDs, and and I, I like watching Branch train, right? Because it's it's fun to watch, and I just like his his whole attitude in the gym. He's he's just that's what I find it very motivating. I mean, whether or not you agree with that style of training, because I mean you know he's sometimes he does very short reps and crazy heavy weights and stuff like that, but I find it fun to watch that. Uh, and again, uh, Ronnie Coleman's DVDs I found fun as well. So I, I'd say those, if I had to pick a favorite, it would be those videos. Just for the pure, hardcore motivation and stuff of watching these guys just throw around ridiculous weights and curse and swear on the on the dumbbells and all that stuff. So that, That's a fun video to watch. Uh, next question. Five, oh, four. four. Our 30 minutes is up. Six. Shut up. There we go. Our 30 minutes is up, guys. I've been a half hour already. Okay, so I'm just going to answer this question that I started here. Uh, what was this? Uh, Roxy is asking, protein bars, yes or no? They have a lot of protein, but also a lot of fat. Not sure if it's worth the sacrifice for the calories. What do you think? That is a great question, Roxy, and my personal opinion on the majority of protein bars that are out there is it's just a candy bar with a scoop of protein mixed in, especially if they taste really good. That's one thing you're going to find with a lot of bars. You could go out and get yourself a, a candy bar at the convenience store, you know, a Mr. Big or a Krispy Crunch or whatever the heck you want, a candy bar, and drink a protein shake. And nutritionally, you'd be getting about the same nutrition as you are in the typical protein bar. That's all it is, candy bar with a scoop of protein. So if, I mean, I personally try to keep that stuff to a minimum. And, uh, I mean, I, I have a protein bar recipe. If you want to make protein bars yourself, you can actually do that. And you can put your own ingredients in there and make a good, healthy Nutrition, nutritionally sound protein bar without all the chemical and crap and stuff that you're going to find in a lot of store-bought bars. Um, where is that? If, if you actually go to my YouTube channel and do a search for it, and, and I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people have protein uh, bar recipes posted on YouTube. But I'm going to give you a link. Just a second now. This is one of my personal favorite protein bar recipes. And I actually got this one out of the Anabolic Cooking Cookbook. If you just go to YouTube and type in uh, Lee Hayward Protein Bar, you'll get the recipe. But it's uh, I, ha I have it blatantly called uh, the best homemade protein bar recipe. All right. Uh, so if you go there and just do a search for that, or again, just search for Lee Hayward Protein Bar Recipe, and you'll get it. And basically what it is, it's using protein powder, oatmeal, and natural peanut butter, and honey, and making your own protein bars with these natural ingredients. So you know what's in the bar. You're in more control of it, and you're getting healthier options. I mean, like you can get healthier fat from the natural peanut butter, 
or you could use natural almond butter, doesn't matter, either or. But you're not getting the, the, the sugar and the processed crap that you're getting in a lot of store-bought protein bars. I, I look at protein bars pretty much the same as I would look at a candy bar. I mean, if, if you're having a cheat meal or something like that, then yeah, okay, go ahead, have a protein bar. But don't make it a staple in your diet. Make, you know, the staples in your diet should be real wholesome foods, real protein, real, real carbs, real vegetables, stuff like that, not protein bars. So that's my opinion on that. All right, folks, this concludes it. Like I said, we, I said I would do 30 minutes of q and I did 30 minutes, so I'm going to clue it up. I'll have the replay of this posted up for you to watch afterwards. And in the meantime, have yourself a fantastic weekend, and I'll be doing the same thing next Friday. So take care, and you can look forward to that. Over and out.